I'd like to uh, introduce Sarah Nelson, the books director of O, the Oprah magazine, and also former editor-in-chief of uh, Publishers Weekly magazine. Sarah, welcome. Hi. Thanks for joining us today. Sure. So I hear you have a really exciting new job. Uh, maybe you could tell us about it. Well, I've uh, taken over as the books director of oh, the Oprah magazine. We do a number of, we do six to eight pages usually of book reviews, interviews, and um, book related content uh, every month and 12 times a year. And I choose the books and assign the reviews and sometimes write some and interviews same. And um, that's what I do. And I spend a lot of time sitting in my wonderful office reading. <laughs> Not a bad job. <laughs> um, so you must have reviewed, gosh, now thousands of, uh, of books in the course of your career. Uh, um, I, guess I, I guess I have. I mean, I, I wrote a book called So Many Books So Little Time, which I read uh, a book a week for a year. It was actually sometimes a little bit more and sometimes a little less, or around 50 books in a year. Um, I, I think I probably read, I don't know, I mean, I really read probably 50 books a year. But then I do what, what I call the, the read-by, which is uh, like a drive-by, <laughs> which is, you know, I read 10 pages or I read 20 pages of something. I read at something, as I say. I mean, I, don't, I would never write a, about something that I hadn't read all of unless I was writing about the process of not finishing it, which I did do in my book. But um, So I, I am sometimes amazed. Um, but, you know, I have no life, so it makes it much easier. <laughs> so uh, given that you've reviewed so many books, uh, I was curious what advice you'd give authors and publishers about getting the attention of major book reviewers. You know, that's a really it's a really hard question. Um, I think um, most book reviewers do what I do, and I'm, I, I consider myself more of a curator at this point, a curator editor than a reviewer per se. The way I do do some reviews, um, you know, is just get write the best book you can. Write and get it into the get it into as many people's hands as you can. I mean, I would get recommendations for books. Uh, I did when I was writing my book. I got recommendations for books from all kinds of people. I mean, sometimes from book publicists who were paid to publicize them. Uh, sometimes from you know my sister's friend at the vet's office. So um, the more you can get people talking about your book. I mean, it's very very hard to publicize a book, and it's very hard to get review attention. Um, especially as you know, there is not, there are not that many print outlets for reviews anymore. Though there are a million um, websites, so uh, I think it's you know, write. The main thing is write the best book that you can write. And and you know, you talked about a million websites. Um, uh, given that there are so many now blogs about books and uh, tweets and uh, much more than there used to be ever before, a lot of more noise about books, um, I was curious if those, um, and, and, and it also seems that there are fewer sort of authoritative sources as well, mm -hmm. you know, book reviewers. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what, what are your thoughts as far as are the, are the are these uh, blogs and tweets getting more important in the minds of people, or what role do they do they play? Um, I think it's sort of fashionable in the in the old world, print journalist world um, that I come from, uh, and that I appreciate. But I think there is this this tendency to say, well, print publications are going away, and print re book reviewers are going away, and review sections are going away, and you know this is the death of book reviewing. And when you point out to people who, who take that stand, uh, well, what about all these websites and what about all these places where you can go and, you know, have your book promoted and they say, well, well those aren't real reviews. And I think that there's a real split um, in the publishing community over what reviews are supposed to do. And I mean, I think that there are an awful lot of reviews. Uh, there are fewer and fewer places that review books now that really review them as literature and say, where does this fit into the canon and into the, the general landscape of literature? But there are many, many more places that tell you, you know, do you want to buy this book for your train? Right. You know, and I think that both are valid. Uh, and I think most people um, really want to know, do I want to spend 25 bucks on this book or not? Mm -hmm. they, only in certain cases, for certain people and for certain authors, do they really want a serious literary analysis of where the book stands in the canon. Mm. 
And if you're a smaller publisher or author, how do you get the attention of a major book reviewer? Well, I actually think the smaller publishers are in better shape in some ways than the larger houses at this point because they have uh, they, they have not fallen prey to some of the excesses that the larger houses had. Their staffs are leaner and they were not paying these ridiculous advances and so on. Um, I think that more small houses at this point are, because there are a lot of people that are out of work in the publishing business. I mean, I, I meet with publicists all the time who have left major houses and are starting their own publicity firms. And for the most part, they are going sometimes back to the big houses for freelance work, but they're also representing the smaller presses. And I think that, you know, it's a, it's a pendulum effect. I mean, we, we have been through 20 years of all publishing being big, big, big publishers and getting bigger all the time, and I think the pendulum is swinging back now, and it's going to be a lot more about the mom and pop publisher, the little guy, the, the, the one out of, you know, Northampton, Massachusetts, who publishes five books a year. I, I think um, people will start to pay attention to them in a way that they haven't. It's just the fashion has shifted. Mm. And in fact, I wanted to ask you about... Um, these bigger publishers where folks are either losing their jobs or nervous about losing their jobs. And I know that you recently went through your own transition. Um, and I was wondering whether you had advice to somebody at a bigger publisher um, in terms of securing their job or, or about the future in general. Well, I mean, I think there were a lot of things that happened in publishing and, and not just to me um, at, at PW. Um, that were very, very dis dis disconcerting to people, to say the least, because uh, in the last couple of years, the people who are getting fired are not necessarily people who weren't doing a good job. Um, sometimes they were doing a better than a good job, but they were being paid too much money. The business model needs to be changed, and there, there was a lot of human casualty to that. And, uh, you know, I'm that is a big question. I mean, how do you secure your job in this economy? I mean, I think it's it's all the stuff that that you know a, a career counselor would tell you: make yourself indispensable. Don't just do one thing. Know how to do a lot of different things. Manage up well. Man, you know, and I think all of those things are good ideas. On the other hand, part of what's so disturbing about this economy is you can do all the right things and you can still lose your job. And so it, it and it's hard to incentivize people to work really, really hard, and you know take on extra assignments because that's going to save them their jobs when it's not necessarily going to save them their jobs. So I think you have a lot of demoralized. Some remaining workers are very de demoralized because they feel like no matter how hard I work, you know maybe they're going to fire me, maybe they're not going to fire me, um, and has it's kind of cut off from reality. Right. So I think it's I think it's a really difficult time. Right. And um, you've worked. You in terms of the course of your career, you obviously were at PW at a trade-focused magazine and now have moved over to a consumer-focused magazine. Right. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were in terms of the future of the more trade-focused magazines right. and whether they're inevitably going to move online or whether they're still... Right. I, I, I do think, um, I mean, I do think that most business-to-business -business magazines, and I think most people think this, um, most business-to-business -business magazines will be online exclusively shortly, um, I mean, within the next year or so. Um, I'm sort of surprised that they haven't gotten there already. Um, so much less expensive to produce. Uh, these are publications, I mean, consumer publications um, deal less with the immediate news than um, than a trade publication does. I mean, it doesn't do you any good if if one trade online trade publication is reporting a big deal that took place on Monday. If they're reporting it in real time on Monday, and you know you're coming out with a print publication a week from now saying all the stuff that everybody's all been talking about all week. So. Um, I remember the time at uh, PW when you were enthusiastic about ebook devices like the Kindle and the Sony Reader. Do you remain optimistic yes. about the future? I do. I, 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 I think that uh, I, I have a Kindle and I have a Sony Reader and I use them a lot. I also read a lot of paper and I will always read both, but I'm not exactly the you know ordinary reader in this way. Um, I think that I think some publishers have a fear of those devices because they think that they're going to cannibalize their readers. I think that's dead wrong. I think it's going to expand 
the readership. I think people, there are certain people who will read certain kinds of books in one format or the other that you would have lost if you didn't have the e-format. Well, thank you so much for Sarah, Sarah for joining us. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.